Hello. Um, right, so a little while ago, I started trying to make a video game, like a multiplayer game in Meteor, thinking, you know, the whole, it gives you the whole connectivity kind of thing for free. It, like, you know, sort of joins everything up for you, so it seemed like an obvious choice. And I made a bunch of mistakes. I learned a lot, and I thought maybe some of you might like to also learn some of the things that I've learned. And so now I'm here. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Right, so um, like I guess a lot of you, I'm primarily like a web developer. So I generally think of things as being, well, meteor deployments especially as being, you know, you are getting a single view into a thing and that's just it. You, you pull down a page and nobody else is going to change that page while you're looking at it. And games, well, multiplayer games, you want the opposite of that. Video games are, you know, a shared simulation that you're all interacting with. And so... It's interesting trying to get Meteor to do something which is very different to what it was originally designed to do, which was, you know, just render one thing to one person. So yeah, what are video games? Um, they're a shared simulation which you can interact with and then see the results of that interaction come back to you to kind of break it down on a very kind of nerdy level. Um, and it can be competitive, cooperative, or just, you know, whatever. And one of the important things is that you shouldn't be able to kind of, you know, in the same way that you think about websites, you shouldn't be able to go behind the scenes and change things along an in, you know, a route that you weren't supposed to take. So you shouldn't be able to kind of reach into the code and change things outside of the rules. Right. Um, yeah, so thinking about games, we're running a simulation. Um, and that simulation is going to be running on the server or wherever it is all the time and kind of burning up CPU. And so a server can generally only support so many people at once. And so even with a game like World of Warcraft, you know, where you've got thousands or millions of people, like those people are generally split up between different servers. Um, and so players are grouped onto different servers, and each of them are interacting with some instance of some shared world. So even if a bunch of elves are hanging out in a tavern, there could be millions and millions of other elves hanging out in that same tavern all over the world, but they don't all see each other. It's not that crowded. They're all given different instances of that tavern to hang out in. Um, and so when I started making this game, I quickly realized that it probably wasn't cool to constantly be running physics simulations on the free Meteor servers that they give you. Like, <laughs> I mean, we're all dimly aware in the back of our minds that, you know, they're probably going to you know, cut off the supply at some point in the far future. And if I start just constantly churning up the processors all the time, that day is going to get closer and closer and closer. <laughs> so... I tried to be ethical and I decided, you know what, like we should probably pull this back and do as much of it on the client as we can. And that's what I'm trying to talk about today. <coughs> so yeah, moving out. Um, so we want to have a bunch of instances of the world that we're simulating, but we don't want to have it all in the same place on the server. We want to kind of, you know, move it out to the different computers connected. So we want, so Meteor is cool because it kind of, you know, joins everything up for us. And it gives us a starting point, like each computer connects and it says, it sees from Meteor, from the database that we've got, this is the state of the world. And you can start simulating from there. Um, I'm kind of going to go forward. Uh, right, so I'm just going to go through a few different techniques and show you a couple of them in action on Meteor. Right, so the first one, like really the first one in history, the one that's been running for, I guess, thousands of years, if you want to think about it like that, is deterministic lockstep. Um, and this is basically what you're doing if you play chess by email. Like, your simulation is so simple that every time you run it, you can be sure that exactly the same thing is going to happen. Like in chess, you know, you're not throwing the pieces around and hoping they're going to fall. Where they fall, like, you know that if you move your knight one to the left and two <coughs> to the right, it's going to end up in the same place every time. So you can play that by email because there's no chance involved. It's really simple. Um, and this is actually how Doom multiplayer worked. So back in whenever that was, like early 90s or whatever, like um, that was how it worked over local network, over LAN. 
So on every kind of refresh, on every tick, every player, every player uh, puts their input in, decides what they're going to do, and then advances their own version of the simulation and announces to every other player what they did. And every other player then you know, goes through the same steps, does the same simulation. Um, and that somehow just all works. As long as there's no chance on anybody's client, as long as you know, everything's going to happen the same, then that works. Um, and if you're doing this 60 times a second, it works great over LAN. Like if everyone's advancing the simulation, announcing to everyone else, everyone waits for everyone else's inputs and then you know, kind of goes forward, that works great. But if any one player has to wait, it's kind of like, if, if anyone has like, any lag, then everyone has to wait. And it's kind of like, if you're playing Monopoly and someone has to go to the toilet every single turn, <laughs> it's basically like that. So the two ways of dealing, yeah, the two ways of dealing with it, either you wait every single turn or you just say, they're not taking their turn, just do whatever. Th there's two ways of dealing with it and neither are very good. Either everyone waits or one player just gets ignored. So yeah, it, it worked for Doom over LAN. It didn't work great once we came to the internet age. Um, so before I talk about the other ones, I kind of want to um, set out some of the, my aims in trying to get Meteor to work, or multiplayer to work on Meteor and my assumptions about where Meteor will be running as well. So we want physics of some kind, I think. Well, at least I do. Um, like, things are going to be moving around, and you want them to, say, stop when they hit walls, or maybe you want gravity to affect them. You're going to want something, some force to be affecting them every time we kind of advance this simulation. Uh, so we want that. And the devices connected could be, well, anything from, you know, HTC wildfires from five years ago up to you know, new MacBooks, whatever. So we want to be able to, we want to try at least to support as many of these things as we can. The game should feel like it's happening fairly snappily, even in situations where our round trip from the client to the server or the host and then back again, maybe taking you know, 200, 500 milliseconds, whatever. Like, we want it to feel fairly snappy, and that's quite an important thing. Um, and also that people are unreliable. And, <laughs> you know, people could close their browsers and people could suddenly drop in or people could refresh or, you know, do any old thing. And we want to, we, you know, we have to expect that and we have to support it. Right. Sorry, there's a fair few assumptions we have to start with before we kind of get going. Um, WebRTC is really cool and some of you might know about it. Um, it's kind of the future of, you know, video calling and all that kind of stuff. But it's not supported in Safari or on iOS yet, which is a pretty big chunk of the market. So we kind of have to, if we want to support all devices, we have to just got to write it off for now. Um, and my other assumption, and these are some pretty big assumptions coming up, are that so server-hosted games worked pretty well 10 years ago. People were playing Counter-Strike 10 years ago, and it was working fine. They weren't, well, they were complaining because, you know, gamers. But, <laughs> like... <laughs> They survived. Everyone kind of got there in the end, and it was all right. Now, we don't want to have a server-hosted game because, you know, we'll you know, piss off Meteor. Um, we want to host things on the client. And the, if things are going from the client to a Meteor server and back to other clients, that's going to take twice as long as a server-hosted game. So roughly twice the latency. And my big assumption is that the average person's internet connection is roughly twice as fast as it was 10 years ago, and so it should balance out. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Right, so uh, I'll talk about the super simple approach, client to host. Well, client to server traditionally, but we're moving, we're making a client the server, so client to host. So the host runs the simulation. They're doing the physics and they're tracking all of the players or bodies or, well, physical bodies, sorry, I should uh, say right from the off. Um, yeah, all the kind of things that are happening in the world, they simulate that and advance that kind of physical process. Um, and clients, which are other computers connected to this Meteor server, um, subscribe to updates about that world and also tell whoever is hosting it what, you know, what their intentions are. They send their inputs to the host. And then on each refresh, the, you know, every client renders whatever their most recent update on the world was. Um, right, so now might be a good time for um, how many of us are on the Wi-Fi here? Oh boy. 
Okay, if you're not, don't have a rush because we're going to move the internet pretty quickly. But, <laughs> um, okay, what am I? I am 192.168.11202. I'll type that in here. Oh, that's really small. Ba boom. Okay, so. Ba -ba -boom. Can you see that? Yeah, All right, cool. Right, so if you go there. Oh, yeah, of course, because we're looking at the same screen, aren't we? Computers. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think one person's there already. Oh. Do, do, do. All right, so this is the simple version of our multiplayer working over just the local network, just over the Wi-Fi. So we are technically playing video games right now. We are technically having fun. <laughs> um, and the way this works is you click uh, on a point in the screen and your orb should move towards it. That's, yeah, this is by my definitions a game. <laughs> um, um, on, me, so I think there might be there is a small bug with resizing the window because of the stuff. So it should be fine now. Um, so how is it for everybody else? Like reasonably snappy or fairly jittery? Unresponsive. Uh, yeah, the things don't move very really fast. Um, so your player... Right. Yeah, that's a feature. So your player is the yellow one. Um, oh, yeah, so that's a bug. <laughs> sometimes you get two players and sometimes you don't get any. So... You know, them's the brakes. <laughs> okay, but we're all getting distracted. All right, so this is... So this is our client host. This is the super simplest kind of implementation of multiplayer we can do with Meteor. And this is kind of roughly how it works. We've got a collection of players, which, is, which basically maps um, users, so logged in users, to physical bodies in the simulation. Um, we've got another collection of bodies in the simulation, so that we can, you know, when a new uh, client connects, they can pull down all the stuff they're going to be simulating and then start listening for updates about those bodies. Um, and those... Those are collections because those are the things that we want to survive across refreshes. If every single client suddenly loses the internet, we kind of want that state to hang around for a little while at least. And so we want them to be able to come back and be like, OK, this is the state of the world. Let's start ticking again. And then we've got streams. Um, some of you might have worked with streams already. It's, you know, um, Arunoda on GitHub did this thing um, which uh, I might be corrected on this, but as far as I understand it, it kind of short circuits the whole collections thing in Meteor. So you don't go through the Mongo database at all, but you're using the same kind of protocols to talk to each other. So it'll try WebSockets and then kind of try a bunch of other things as it kind of downgrades if you don't have WebSockets. So it's as fast as an update to a collection, but you don't have to worry about kind of cleaning up after yourself with the collection. It's just a stream of data. So we've got two streams going on. We've got a snapshot stream, which the host sends out to clients, um, telling them updates um, about things in the world, and input stream, which you know, clients send what they want to do to the server or to the host. Go on. And snapshots look like this. We've got an ID, which maps to, um, I should say that we're using um, p2.js as a physics engine and pixie.js as a rendering engine. Um, Pixie's nice because it uses WebGL and then does Canvas and then doesn't do anything at all. There's only two levels. Um, yeah, so we've got physics and rendering engine, and those we've tried to keep fairly separate so that you know, they're not too tied together and we can send physics without worrying about the rendering and all that kind of stuff. Um, but 
each, um, each object in the physics simulation and each object kind of on the, you know, in the rendering has an ID. And so we want to, you know, we want to make sure that we're tied to that when we send a snapshot um, out about the world. So our snapshot looks like this. We've got an ID. Uh, we've got the position of that body in the world. Um, in our demo, we don't have an angle because they're circles and that's pointless. Um, like we, if they rotate, they look like circles still. Um, and theoretically, we might have effects. Uh, like, you know, if, if, you, if it's a little dude with a jetpack, then he might be jetpacking around. And because we're only moving objects, we're not really sending inputs to the clients, we wouldn't know that, um, you know, we needed to show a jetpack booster or anything. So that's as much as we're sending with the simplest kind of implementation. And our update function just says, if we're the host, then we advance the simulation and we tell everyone about it. And if we're not the host, then we just pull down the most recent update and um, update our view of the world. And then both, you know, in both situations we render. And that's it. Um, but, right. So if we, now, if you're not on the Wi-Fi, you can do this. If we go to p2pmulti.meteor.com, I'll copy that into a bigger window. <coughs> nice. Um, yeah, it's not great, is it? Um, I've never tested it with more than three players, because that's the number of computers I have available to me. So, uh, yeah, cool. Right, so this is the simplest, you know, um, simplest implementation, but the thing with this is that we're rendering, we're ticking the simulation forwards, we're advancing the simulation 60 times a second uh, on the host. And we're sending at exactly that rate. So we're trying to send 60 updates a second down a web socket, down a wire. And you know, we're doing that because it kind of matches the, um, the refresh rate on the average screen. So if you've worked with request animation frame um, in you know, the animation API, it tries to hit 60 frames a second. Um, so yeah, my assumption is 60 frames a second, we're going to try and push that down the wire. But that's like a lot of stuff to push all the time, and it kind of gets clogged up. And the thing with WebSockets, as opposed to WebRTC, is that it tries to get every message through. You know, it's the trusty postman. Um, like, if one gets clogged up, then you've got this whole backlog to work through. So what we see over the internet is that, you know, a couple of things will, you know, not, you know, every tick we may get an update or we might not, and then, you know, three frames, 10 frames down the line, we might suddenly get a whole bunch and we just show the most recent one. And so our player will suddenly jump from one point to the next, which isn't ideal. So the way that we get around that, that's the start of the slideshow. That's the start of the slideshow also. Um, the way that we get around that is that duh, 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 we interpolate between updates. So we lower the send rate. Um, we lower it down to, say, 20 updates a second rather than 60. And on the client side, what we do is we wait slightly. So rather than always showing the most recent update, we um, wait until we've got two, and then we can kind of smooth between them. So in order to get a smoother effect, we kind of deliberately introduce a bit of lag to all of our players. Um, and Right. So one thing I should point out here is um, we've all got our usernames, which are very non-human friendly, down the right. And what I tried to do is put a little kind of CPU test in so that it sees how fast your computer is at running the physics um, and gives you a score based on that. So we've got a lot of high ones and one low one. But what I can do with this, uh, the maximum score is 200. <laughs> so I Oh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, IP address, sorry. IP address is, yeah, 50.173. All right, so we're going to set a new host, and it's going to be one of you, and I don't know who, but you will see the words, you're the host, appear in your top right. 
So, there you go. Okay, so I'm not the host, so one of you is. So, yeah, we, are, we can arbitrarily switch the host because it's basically just everyone is listening to streams and collections and publishing, well, the host publishes two streams and collections and that's it. So we can basically turn on a dime. Uh, yeah, sometimes you just don't get dots. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this all turned out to be a bit more complicated than I thought it would be when I agreed to do this last week, basically. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Uh, for, with difficulty. Um, you can match it up with uh, localstorage.uuid is your username. So... <laughs> Yeah, just like in video games. We are having fun, remember. <laughs> All right, uh, so I should probably move on at this point. Um, right, so we've shown interpolation. Um, and interpolation is cool, it smooths things out slightly, and you have to trust me on that one, because uh, you can't really see the effects. Um, but it also means that we have to send slightly more data with each snapshot, which you know, is kind of balanced out by the fact that we're sending them much uh, less frequently. So you have to send our velocity and our angular velocity, so how fast it's moving and how fast it's rotating, so that we can smoothly interpolate between. Um, that's because if you imagine that you have a bouncing ball, like it's going like this, um, what's going to happen if it's just interpolating between positions is most of the time it's kind of just going to hover in the middle. Because one update's going to be here, one update's going to be here, and if it's just aiming for the middle of everything, it's just going to kind of hover along the ground. So you have to kind of give it more information so it can interpolate more cleverly. So, yeah, slightly larger packets, but less often, and it kind of balances out. <coughs> the problem with both of the methods we just saw is that, depending on your latency, you will always have to wait to see the results of your own actions. So if you walk forwards, or if you, you know, what, if you walk forward, you're essentially telling the host that you're walking forwards, and they have to go, okay, you walked forward, this is what happens. And so, you know, if there's a 250 millisecond round trip, it's going to be half a second before you actually see yourself walk forwards, which is pretty, you know, counterintuitive to most people. It sucks. So, yeah, that's not great. Um, and even, you know, even though we're interpolating between packets or sort of interpolating between snapshots, um, if we lose a few, then we're still going to see just nothing happen on the client, which also is not great. So the solution, which is uh, the pretty complicated solution, is client-side prediction. We want to see something happen as soon as we press a button. We want to see ourselves walking forward as soon as we walk forward. Um, but that means that you know, if, we, if we're facing a wall and we say, I'm walking forward, and the client just, you know, whatever, just blindly walks forwards, we're going to go through that wall, and we don't want that. That's kind of no, that's not much better than just having everything really laggy. So what we do is we have to run the physics on every client. Um, and then we can send snapshots much less frequently. But every client is basically predicting what's going to happen um, in response to their inputs and then being told by the host if what they think is wrong. So the host simulates the world and maintains authority, and that's super important. Like the host is always the one, the host always has the one true reality. And where there are disagreements, the host basically goes, nope, you're wrong, this is what's actually happening. So yeah, players report their current state to the host. Oh yeah, so the interesting problem with this though is that um, it creates this interesting problem where when the client gets corrected about where they should be, they've Right, so they've sent an input to the server, say, you know, uh, it takes 50 milliseconds to get there, and then the server advances the simulation and tells them that actually what they think, where, where they thought they were when they uh, started to walk forwards is wrong, they need to be slightly to the left. But the server comes back with that 50 milliseconds after it receives the input. So 100 milliseconds after the player started walking forward and thought they were going to be here, servers being like, no, actually, you were there. You were to the left when you started walking forward. And it sends them that correction. But if we just say, OK, let's move to the left. Let's move to where we were when you know, let's move to where the server tells us we should be. We're actually going back in time because we're undoing our own action that we just made. It's a bit of a weird one. 
kind of gets a bit like relativity when you start to think about all the multiplayer stuff. Um, yeah, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? Um, there's this cool diagram, which I <laughs> stole from the website. If people want to look at that, or I could just skip over it. Um, so basically, and yeah, it's compounded by the problem that if the client moves again after it sends that first input and it's going to be corrected, the server's going to come back and be like, this is where you were, and the client's going to be like, wait, no, I have more news. <laughs> um, and so what we have to do, essentially, is we have to, when the server comes back and tells us that we were wrong, we have to rewind time back to when the disagreement, you know, when the reality clash occurred. Then we have to correct, we have to correct ourselves, so put ourselves back into the true, one true timeline, um, and then re enter all the inputs that we had entered since the disagreement. So if we'd, if we'd walked forward and, I don't know, jumped and did some other things, um, and then the server's like, no, actually, when you were walking forward, you were supposed to go over a cliff, like, that's all wrong. What we have to do is we have to go back to that cliff and then walk forward and then jump and re-simulate all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. This, I, I couldn't get this done in time, basically. This, it'd be cool to like, you know, show you all demos of all these bits, but you know, this is real life, guys, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, what, so, but we have to do all of that invisibly, that's the thing. We have to, uh, without the client, without the, sorry, the person sitting at the computer seeing, we have to rewind time, correct everything, put the player back where they should be, and then, if we're being nice, we should kind of smooth things between, so interpolate from where we think we are to where we actually are. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about determinism a little bit. Uh, <laughs> am I running on? Or? Uh, you're in it now. All right, I'm in it. <laughs> uh, so determinism is basically saying that if we uh, run the same steps from the same starting point a bunch of times, exactly the same things will happen, um, which is quite an important thing in physics, especially <laughs> multiplayer physics. Um, and JavaScript is not good at that. Um, because so all the maths that JavaScript does, all the kind of floating point stuff, will often happen differently, even in the same browser it's happening twice, and definitely across different browsers. There are different optimizations in different JavaScript implementations that mean that if you're doing maths in the same place, especially very complicated and lots of it maths, like it's going to happen differently in different places. Um, which for client-side prediction is not great, because the server and the client are often going to disagree about what happens if they're worlds play by slightly different rules. So we're always going to have to be correcting the client uh, very often, which, yeah, might lead to a lot of jittering and things moving around and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so true peer-to-peer -peer has, you know, this is the kind of WebRTC niceness um, where everyone is running a simulation and telling everyone else, like, directly peer-to-peer -peer without going through a server, um, what happens. And it's you know, a really nice idea, but again, because of determinism, it's not very ideal for JavaScript, um, because everyone's, going to, everyone's worlds are going to branch off at some point, and we're going to have to constantly be correcting it. And the thing with peer-to-peer -peer is that if, we're, if there's no one single point where authority lies that can tell everyone else off if they're kind of getting out of line, then that doesn't really work, um, or at least not with a physics kind of game. Like with, with chess, it's, a great, it's kind of a great um, model because you don't need to go through a server to work out what the rules are. Like those rules are really simple. Um, and obviously with WebRTC, it means we bypass the server almost entirely. We just set up the connections and then kind of carry on. Yep, determinism. And oh yeah, and that's the thing with JavaScript is people can just like screw around in the console and send off requests and do whatever. Like, that's, that's kind of something you've just got to accept. So either don't make competitive games or plan really well for that eventuality. Like, people are going to cheat. People, people just, I don't know, people are terrible. Um, right. So, yeah, what I'm, so I started making a game and then I kind of got sidetracked doing all this. What I'm probably going to end up doing with my game is use the client hosts with interpolation, uh, interpolation, um, model as a baseline, um, upgrade to WebRTC if it's supported. Um, unreliable WebRTC is important because with games, with updates being sent about the state of the world, like if, um, 
if an update arrives late, it's basically as good as it not arriving at all. You don't, you're not interested in what happened five seconds ago, you're interested in what the latest state of the world is. So use unreliable WebRTC, it means that it doesn't promise that um, every packet is going to get to the other end, but it's quicker. Um, yeah. <coughs> um, upgrade to client-side prediction if the device is powerful enough. Um, if you're using it all the time, people's iPhones are going to get really hot, and you don't want that. <coughs> um, and yeah, so we tried a little CPU score test thing. You kind of want to be constantly assessing who should be the host and switching when you can. And yeah, if you can, like sending some data directly between clients rather than going through the server and back out. And that's basically it. Yeah, that's, that's games.